Welcome to the Ring of Fire podcast for igniting creative inspiration. Today, we're going to be joined with special guest Erin St. Blaine, who is going to share her story of fire and light. Let's dive in and see how this conversation unfolds. Enjoy today and be sure to like and subscribe as well as share this podcast with anyone who you think might be interested in this content. Thank you so much for watching. Enjoy today's episode with Aaron St. Blaine. Today we're joined on the Ring of Fire podcast with Aaron St. Blaine, who is a maker, a performer, an artist, and a mermaid. She ran an er entertainment company called Fire Pixie Entertainment in San Francisco Bay Area for nearly 20 years, doing shows all over the world with her troupe of amazing dancers who... I was one of them. <laughs> Anyways, so her work has transitioned into building light up costumes and large scale LED art pieces for festivals and public spaces in and around the Sacramento area. So I will share with all of the viewers your links, Erin, in the comments below so people can go to your website and take a look at all the amazing that you do and also reach out to you at some point to say, I want one of those amazing LED light <laughs> art pieces that you create. But so let's let's just start this conversation um, with welcoming you on. Thank you for joining. Hi. Thank you so much. And I have so much gratitude for you for all the things that you're doing. I'm so excited watching you and watching you grow and watching you create. And I'm delighted to be a part of it. The feeling is super mutual. You and I go a long ways back and I've always been very grateful to you for the connection point, the fire dancing. Previous episode of this, I shared my story leading into fire dancing. And so the reason why I was like, Aaron has to be the surprise special first guest on the Ring of Fire is because, you know, you were the person that I reached out to that then connected me to Alex that created that connection that just took everything off and then eventually came full circle to where... You know, I was working for you and with you, and so I am equally very grateful for the connection, for you, for your amazing talent and beauty and gifts of light that you bring to the world. So let's start with the, the burning question. How did you get into fire dancing? <laughs> uh, let's see. I was at a... It was 1998. It was actually last century. Uh, and I was at a, uh, a an event at the Exploratorium in San Francisco, which was an all night event where they were webcasting the last solar eclipse of the 20th century, which was a huge deal at the time. Webcasting was not a thing anybody did. So we went to this all night party because the solar eclipse was on the other side of the world and uh, just kind of hung out with all the, the folks there. And there were fire dancers at this event and it was the first time I ever saw them. And I was just, my jaw was on the floor. I was like, I'd never seen anything like that before. And it was just absolutely, I was just like, that is what I wanna do. It grabbed me and it wouldn't let go. I had like no choice after that. And then just a few days later, I went to a party where there were some fire dancers there. So I actually got to walk up to them and talk to them and interact and look at their props and you know ask how they learned. And back then there was no such thing as a fire dancing school. Uh, <laughs> nobody was doing that. Um, I think uh, Issa and uh, the Temple of Poi was just not even founded yet. I met her a couple years later and she was one of the first pioneer teachers out there. And um, I just had to basically learn myself. We didn't have YouTube either. So uh, we just picked up our Poi and we started spinning them and started playing with them and seeing what could happen. Uh, and then reached out to the community through like things like Burning Man. Uh, I was in Fire Conclave in like 2001, which was a long time ago and very exciting. But it was, you know, there were 50 fire dancers there, which was the biggest gathering of fire dancers that had ever happened anywhere. <laughs> so it was so exciting to just be a part of that. And I got to start to know some of the people in my area and community. We started running fire jams in uh, the Fremont Union City area, in the Bay Area back when, uh, you know, we, it was right by the BART. So people would come from all over the Bay Area, just come to our fire jam. And we kind of really got to know the community like that. Uh, and then at the same time, I got laid off from my webdesign.com job because everybody else did too in about 2002 and started doing entertainment. And since I was doing, I was doing princess parties and uh, mermaid shows and face painting and balloon animals for kids. Um, and since I was already doing that, I started doing fire shows too. And turned out we had the first fire dancing website 
on the internet. <laughs> we were the only ones out there because I was a web designer. I had the chops for that. So I went ahead and built us, you know, using those photos we got at the fire jam, I built us a website and started doing it professionally. And uh, I think it was 2008. Uh, it was when the internet really was largely taking off and we were starting to be found all over the place. And so we started getting flown all over the world. They wanted fire dancers in Bermuda. There weren't any. And the only people on the internet was us. So, <laughs> I mean, we were also, you know, we did a lot of gigs. We practiced a lot. Um, I, it was my uh, ex-husband and I were an acrobatic duet. We did a lot of shows together and uh, just were really, really passionate about it. So um, it really got a lot of attraction and momentum in those early years when the the pond was really small. And then I got to meet great performers like Sequoia <laughs> and uh, a lot of other fantastic people, which helped us grow and really expand and uh, and, you know, turn this little fun flow hobby into something that was professional and large scale and insured and grown up, I suppose. <laughs> Grown up is a good way to put it. it. It became like almost larger than life in some way, like thinking about the, you know, the trajectory of how it, like you said, it kind of grabbed you, it took hold and it wouldn't let you go. Right. It like, there was something that happened and I love how you tied it to the eclipse. Cause actually at the time we're doing this, I don't know when this will air, but at the time we're doing this, we're approaching another major eclipse. Right. So it's interesting how it's like the two, you know, ends of this or not that it's over either, but it's just definitely not having the same momentum. They're going around. And yeah, always, definitely. It's yeah. trans. The nature of the fire is transformation. So it's mm -hmm. definitely going through its transformation phase. Yeah. I love how it was like it, it, it did. It like had a life of its own and it became this like the way you're describing it more than probably you ever could have imagined from that point then when you originally saw the fire dancers and you were like, whoa, what is this? And then it hooked you and then it just took off. Yeah. So when you reflect back on it, if you had to kind of take a big bird's eye view of it and give it a, let's say three words, what would be the three words you would use to describe that process and that experience for you? Wow. The process and experience. Um, you know, like what comes to mind is make good art, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is still my mantra these days. You know, I wanted I wanted to be good. I wanted it to be beautiful. I wanted to inspire people. So make good art. So yeah, that's excellent. And I love that. So that so let that kind of segues then into where this conversation could go next, because this is really about the the grounding point of fire dancing and fire art, right? However, it's also this transformation of where is it going? So we've looked at where you were. Let's look at what the trans the transformation has been for you and then kind of bring it towards like what you're doing now and how it's moved for you. So tell us more about the other art and other creative uh, processes that you, other things that you do, you're a maker. So what are you doing? What are you making? Well, as I mentioned, uh, the other part of my entertainment company was kids shows. And uh, one of the one of the things that I really got into um, was mermaid shows. Uh, I would do these parties where I was in my little aerial costume as bandex, you know, and I'm sitting next to the pool in a hundred degree heat when all the kids are in the pool swimming and I'm the mermaid. I'm like, that's not gonna, that's not okay. You know, so I made myself a swimmable mermaid tail and started doing mermaid shows. Um, at the same time, I wanted to do lots and lots and lots of fire shows, but that is not always possible. It's difficult. Um, people need permits. If you're inside, it's pretty much off the table. Uh, there's so many events that you just are eliminated from because they can't have fire. So I was trying to develop another show that was just as good as fire using LED lights. But of course, back in the early 2000s, we had glow sticks, you know, we had street lights, which were breakable. And you remember those things, you put them on a string, you hit them together once and they're just dead and they're terrible. Um, so I started learning about LED lights. I wanted light up costuming. I wanted light up poi that would really rock, you know, and, and to be something that I could offer instead of fire that would give just as much value. Uh, and that was quite a journey. And as I tried combining these two passions, I got the idea to make a light up mermaid tail. 
uh, which in retrospect was like the stupidest idea I ever had. Had I known how hard it was going to be to make this thing, I never would have started. But luckily, I did not know how hard it was going to be. And so I went ahead and uh, jumped in with both fins, I suppose, and I uh, worked like my butt off to try and get this thing uh, working. And I succeeded. Um, her, my mermaid character name is Mermaid Glimmer. And she was the first and still like, I think the fanciest LED swimmable mermaid tail in the world. Um, and during the process of building this thing, I needed so much help. And I ended up connecting with an LED artist who was real local to me, who worked for a company called Adafruit. And he did a lot of development for the microcontrollers and the tech that makes this stuff run. He was looking for a poi spinner. <laughs> he had developed some DIY um, poi that did persistence of vision, which is basically when you when it when it spins through the air, it makes a picture. Uh, and it's like low res LED picture, but oh, they were cool. And they were so much cooler than anything else that was on the market. Um, so I, you know, did everything I could to ingratiate myself. And uh, this, and then he helped me a whole bunch with them with the mermaid tail. Through this connection, I uh, ended up getting really interested in LED art and development and ended up having an opportunity to work with Adafruit. And Adafruit is a fantastic company that's owned by a woman. And she is really interested in getting more women interested in electronics and LEDs. And the stuff that I want to make is mermaid tails and pretty poi lights that light up in costumes, you know. So uh, it was a real good fit. She she really wants girly stuff because if we can get women interested in LEDs, we're going to double our audience. With all of this coming together, then I uh, ended up getting to work with Adafruit. Um, Adafruit's owned by a woman. Her name's Lamar Freed, and she is just one of the smartest people I've ever met. Um, and the audience for LED DIY electronics is something like 96% men. Um, and so she being, you know, being a woman really wants to, well, double her business, first of all. If lots of women got interested in DIY electronics, we'd have twice as many customers. Um, and so she hired me to do projects where I, you know, I make things like mermaid tails and fairy wings and pretty dresses that light up. Um, and I'm really trying to get more girls and more women interested in this stuff. Um, it's a lot of fun. I have over 125 tutorials that I've written um, on the Adafruit website. And uh, some of the more recent ones, I, I made a beautiful white dress that appears to be dripping lights, just like uh, at the end of The Little Mermaid when she comes out of the water in this gorgeous white dress and all the water is dripping off of her. That's kind of what it evokes. Um, I'm making a light up furry vest, like a Burning Man vest right now with lots of different light styles and an app that you can control with your phone. Um, after that, I'm doing garden lights, you know, that are going to be addressable and mappable. It's pretty fun. Like, so I'm doing real accessible projects for my house, for costuming, for performance. And uh, it's a lot of fun. It's keeping me real sharp and motivated. It's, I'm learning every day on this job and uh, I'm really enjoying it. And then at the same time, I started working for Dive Bar which is a mermaid themed bar here in Sacramento. Uh, if you haven't been, it's amazing. <laughs> it's on K Street and we have mermaid shows every single night, um, usually 9.30 and 10.30 at night. Um, I'm actually swimming in the dive bar tank tonight. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. And uh, we have a 40 foot saltwater aquarium where we, we have live mermaid shows. It's rad. Um, I've also been hired by that, uh, the people that run that bar to decorate it using my LED light skills. So I've created some large scale installations, um, most notably a big swarm of giant LED jellyfish that uh, are all interconnected and they all have LED lights inside. So I can run light animations through the swarm and it looks like the jellyfish are whispering to each other or giggling or whatever it is. Uh, it has really like elevated the place. It looks amazing in there. Um, and then I just kept making jellyfish because they're so cool um, and ended up with another 100 or so jellies that now I use for event rentals. Um, I just got to put them up at the art museum here in Sacramento. Um, I just got a gig where I got to put them up at the aquarium in San Francisco, like the Steinhardt Aquarium was having a hundred year anniversary. So I got to put them up there, which was very exciting. Um, I'm talking to a shopping mall here in Sacramento about putting them up there and uh, doing festivals. It's been a lot of fun. Um, I have so much performing experience at these types of events and festivals and things that I kind of know how, you know, all that works, but it's real, 
it's a lot a growth edge to come at it from a, an art installation perspective instead of a performer perspective. But then I can also combine the two, which is cool. We did a Tiki Oasis, which is a big Tiki bar convention, and they hired us to put up jellyfish and be a mermaid. So, um, you know, it it works out uh, pretty, pretty well. It is amazing the doors that open when you just start to follow your creativity and your curiosity and your bliss. Yeah, that's awesome. I love the transformation from the fire to the water to the light in essence, but it's all blending together in light at this point. So actually I have a question. I, my question for you is what drives your inspiration for these projects that you're getting? What What's propelling you? What inspires you into these projects? Uh, well, it's all different things. Um, a lot of times it's the people around me. I want to make, uh, I just made light up Rapunzel hair that lights up um, when you sing, like just in the <laughs> Rapunzel movie, because my niece was turning two and wanted a Rapunzel wig. And uh, so I was just like, well, I could do better than that. You know? <laughs> so, uh, and then I, that turned into an Adafruit project. It's an absolutely fantastic project. It's something that kids can, you know, um, my, my new family situation includes a 10 year old and a six year old and the 10 year old is learning to code and is really interested in this kind of stuff. So I made a project that she could do. Um, and that's been a lot of fun too. It's been a really good source of connection with these little girls that I'm living with now. Um, to be able to give them projects and kind of teach them kind of how some of this is possible. It's really neat that my mission was to sort of try and inspire little girls. And suddenly I'm surrounded by little girls who are dying to be inspired. <laughs> so it sounds like yeah, I don't know, the universe or whatever has provided exactly what I need for that kind of thing. What kind of skills what does do you use, do you put to use with the different art forms that you're doing? Like what kind of just random skills are going into play for you? Oh, there's so many. Um, and it's all, you know, uh, everything builds on everything and whatever skills I have, I use. So I've got, uh, you can kind of see my maker space back here. I've got a sewing area right here. Um, over here, I've got my electronics workstation all set up. And over here is like vinyl cutting and, uh, you know, um, any, anything and everything. <laughs> um, and then other skills that'll come in real handy is things like video editing, you know, um, Instagram skills, like learning how to make reels and TikToks and that kind of thing has been a real valuable skill in the last couple of years. Um, and then um, also just doing interviews. I go to a lot of festivals and I'll interview makers. Um, and uh, I sometimes do crew for large scale art. It's, uh, you know, it's really about the people I surround myself with as well. Um, and when I meet a new person, I'll get an inspiration, you know, or we put on little, uh, we put on little magic shows here in Sacramento too. Uh, so every month or every couple months, we do a show um, elsewheremagic.com is our little website for that. And uh, they're pretty small. We run a little black box theater and then we get to just try out new artwork. Uh, my partner has a bubble show that he's been doing, which has been really amazing. So I've been building tech for the bubble show. I built a little light up bubble table for him to make bubbles on, which was really cool. Um, and then I can develop my own LED dance show. And that's going in some pretty interesting directions. Like for our last show, I made a giant backdrop of basically little paper lanterns, those little Chinese paper lanterns. And then I hooked them up to software, uh, you know, put LEDs in each one. Uh, similar to the jellyfish. And I hooked him up to software that was sound reactive. And then also the software has a live camera mode. So what I ended up doing for that show was I could point the iPad camera at myself and then dance around with my LED light props. And then whatever was happening with the lights in my hands would be reflected on the big display of balls behind me. So if I went from left to right with red double staffs, then a big wash of red would go from left to right across the backdrop. Um, it was amazing and pretty next level. I never seen anything quite like this in performance. And so we're doing another show, I believe, uh, May 10th and 11th. And that is uh, I'm going to I'm going to be doing uh, building on some of the pieces that I did in the last show and uh, seeing what else I can do with this technology. Um, it's been a lot of fun. It's been uh, a really interesting ride and a really interesting challenge to see what I can come up with. Yeah, our artistic creations uh, definitely are, you know, sometimes they flow with ease and sometimes they're like climbing Mount Everest to get to them, right? But they always, it's like a learning process and a growth. But I like how you're 
you know, one is kind of building on the next. And then when an idea goes like with the lights and the next show, you're going to explore it and see where else that can go and where that's going to take you with like the dance and the movement, uh, in addition to the lanterns and the light behind you. So what, what information would you have for somebody watching this regarding creative inspiration? Like maybe someone who is feeling that they have some, you know, calling within them, but they haven't quite identified identified it yet or been able to really place it in what what would you say to that person um follow your curiosity whatever is alive for me is the thing that I wake up thinking about and I'm really excited about and I am real lucky in that I've been able to design my life so that whatever it is I'm most excited about gets to be my priority uh, so many times we, our creativity and our, our passion projects get put at the bottom of a big long list of responsibility. Um, but one of the things I like to do is I like to give myself maybe an hour at the beginning of every day to do the project that I want to do, whether it's going to make me money or whether it's going to push my show forward or what, but giving myself time to just follow my, my stupid little ideas <laughs> um, is really essential to keeping all of my ideas flowing and to keeping me on track for the stuff that I have to do. Okay. I like that. That's a good practice. Like wake up and follow whatever your, your, whatever you want to do, whatever is really creatively drawing you or whatever your curiosity is in the morning. So follow your curiosity, wake up and do that. So many people have jobs that they hate, right? They wake up and they don't have time to follow their curiosity in the morning. Cause they have to like get up and do all of these things and get to a thing. But inside of them, there is this person that's wishing that they would lose their job at the dot com, in the dot com era right i remember the fear in that moment of jumping off from i'm relying on a job and now i am my job <laughs> there was that was like one of the most scariest moments of my life many many years ago of like coming to that point but i at this point would never go back right to doing it any other way so oh. do you have any information advice or words of wisdom for someone who is knows there has to be something more. They're looking for that creative inspiration and that might direct them or guide them towards, you know, living their life with freedom and being able to rely on themselves. I know it can be real scary, especially if you don't have a safety net. Um, I did. My family was, would have bailed me out. If I had been starving to death, I, they would have fed me, right? Uh, not everybody has that, which makes it a lot harder, but it doesn't need to be all or nothing. Um, it's not hard to take a class in the evening and, you know, let that kind of grow and develop into something. Um, or maybe it is hard. Maybe you got kids and you're never able to go out or anything, but now we have Zoom classes. So it is real possible to find 20 minutes a day or 20 minutes a couple times a week to try and pursue those passions and let them grow naturally. And then the other thing that I would do is just tell everybody what you're doing. Say, hey, I really want to start doing this. Even if it's not your customer base, even if it's not, you know, anybody who might be interested in it, but tell the bus driver, tell the guy at the Trader Joe's, you know, <laughs> hey, and um, I'm doing a show or whatever it is. Um, and uh, it's amazing and surprising, the connections that will come out of that and uh, all the things that I feel are impossible to do by myself are totally possible and easy to do when I have a whole bunch of people helping me. Um, and that is really where uh, the confidence can come from is, is just from community. Excellent. I love that. And I like that what you were saying too, like if you have kids and it's hard and I was, it was thinking about what you said earlier. Now you live with children, you're teaching them how to code. So it's almost like in, invite everybody to participate as well, like seek a support network and invite others to participate and become part of the journey as well and um, tell everybody about it. So is there anything that I haven't asked you that you want me to ask you or that you would like to share at this moment? This would be a good time to just put out there whatever you want to put out. What's alive for me right now is just a lot of gratitude. Um, gratitude is, for me, it is the highest mental state I can get into. Uh, I find that practicing gratitude every day, doing gratitude journals and um, telling people that you're grateful for them and keeping that up at the front of your head. And um, Sequoia, I think you were the one that taught me this back in the day. I think when we both met, we met over email 
And uh, we connected a little bit, but not much. All I did was do some introductions. Uh, and then we met once and then kind of fizzled out. And then you, out of the blue, sent me this beautiful gratitude email where you're like, hey, I just wanted to let you know how much you have changed my life and affected me and how much you've given me just by this one simple touch. And can you imagine if we all did that, if we all let the other people in our lives know how much they mean to us and how much they affected us and how much their few words or a little change really did. You know, as soon as I heard that, I was like, oh, I need to connect with this woman. I need to start booking her. We need to be friends, you know? Um, and that was just really the power of gratitude in action. Um, I want to try and do that more. I want to, everybody who, who really touches my life in a small way, but then makes a major change, I want to let them know. And I want to, I want to express that gratitude and I want to live gratitude forward. And I want to express my gratitude Sequoia, to you for making me realize that all those years ago. It was really the first time I, I felt that power so strongly in action and then look at what has unfolded from it. Yeah. And look, because I'm still sitting here very grateful to you in this moment, bringing it forward. I am deeply grateful for you because the trajectory of my life was like my creativity was, you know, had been opening up in a way. And that just simple connection was such a spark that had a trajectory to it. And then it was just, it was just, it was ready and it was in me. It was already active in me, but it just took that little, like, I'm thinking about your light up thumb, that little like <laughs> that was like, oh, there it is, right? Yeah, so gratitude definitely as the core premise of everything and a main practice. For all the viewers, you can find Erin at erinstaintblaine.com or mermaidglimmer.com. And I will include those links in this podcast uh, beneath it in the comments. Thank you, Erin, so much for showing up and doing this little dance here. <laughs> right we can't play music because it'll get copyright infringement <laughs> thank you so much for watching the ring of fire podcast i uh, hope that your creative inspiration has been sparked just a little bit from today's conversation and please be sure to like and subscribe and check out future episodes there'll be more to come check out aaron's art she is freaking phenomenal like the led art is <laughs> blows my mind bless you every single time like and behind her right now is this giant jellyfish that is going to turn into something but you would never guess it oh see there it is look at that a huge jellyfish that sh is going to turn into something yep so you'll have to check out her pages and her social media to be able to see what ends up becoming of that so Follow your spark of creativity and I'll see you in the next episode. Thank you so much.